first on BBC One, claims of new important evidence in the Carl Bridgewater murder. Rough Justice argues for the case to be reopened. Seventeen years ago, these men were jailed for a murder that horrified the nation. Completely uh, savage, cold-blooded, ruthless, uh, to shoot... A Lawyers say their conviction for the killing of 13-year-old Carl Bridgewater will one day stand alongside miscarriages like Birmingham and Guildford. The Home Secretary, Michael Howard, says he is disinclined to refer the case back to the Court of Appeal. But tonight, Rough Justice discloses new evidence which we believe should cause him to reconsider. Yew Tree Farm is now abandoned. Carl Bridgewater was murdered here as he delivered an evening paper at about 4.20 p.m. on the 19th of September, 1978. He was found on a settee. He'd been shot at close range. The police believe he'd disturbed a robbery. For two months, they drew a blank. Then a second farmhouse was raided by armed robbers. The getaway car was traced. The driver was Vincent Hickey. He knew the police wanted names for Carl's murder. I've signed as you, so you got no right. He offered them Jimmy Robinson, a hardened criminal. I'm coming here to sign on fire. Hickey also implicated an alcoholic burglar called Pat Malloy. After two days in police custody, Malloy confessed to being at Utree Farm when Carl was shot. I, Patrick Malloy, wish to make a statement. I want someone to write down what I say. I was at the farm when that lad, the paper boy, was killed. I was upstairs searching for something of value, anything, money or coins. Four of us had gone to the farm. There were two motors. Malloy said Vincent Hickey, the man who got him arrested, Jimmy Robinson and Hickey's young cousin Michael had been downstairs with Carl when he was shot. The Hickeys and Robinson maintained their innocence and as soon as Malloy got access to a solicitor, he protested the confession was false and had been forced out of him. At the trial, the Crown said the four men had used a car and a van no witnesses saw these vehicles together. The Crown said Robinson's gun was the murder weapon. There was no evidence it was. But the Crown also produced witnesses to say the men had admitted the crime and there was Malloy's confession. On legal advice, he had not gone into the witness box. Courts in 1979 were much more sceptical about claims of fabricated confessions than they are today. Members of the jury, you find the defendant, Michael Hickey, guilty or not guilty of murder, as charged. Guilty. Speak up, Pat. Tell him the truth! Michael Hickey, then 17, was detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. Vincent Hickey, guilty or not guilty of murder, as charged. Guilty. Vincent Hickey got life with a recommendation that he serve a minimum of 25 years. Members of the jury, do you find the defendant, James Robinson, guilty or not guilty of murder, as charged? Guilty. Jimmy Robinson also got a minimum of 25 years. Pat Malloy alone was convicted of manslaughter. He got 12 years. He continued to protest that his confession had been beaten out of him. But in 1981, he died in jail. That year, the remaining three were refused leave to appeal. During the 80s, a campaign to free them gathered pace. They proclaimed their innocence in a series of rooftop demonstrations. There were six police reinvestigations. Three prosecution witnesses retracted their evidence that incriminated the men. In 1989, the case was re-examined by the appeal court. Despite the retractions and new evidence which supported their alibis, the appeal court upheld the verdicts. 
Malloy's confession, said the court, was not the issue. They reached their conclusion independently of it. You lot don't know your asses from your elbows. I'm innocent. We're all innocent. You'll be needing these more than I do now. But while the appeal court may not have relied upon Malloy's confession, at the trial it seems it was at the forefront of the jury's mind. If anything was central to this case, it was that confession. There was no eyewitness evidence, no forensic evidence. And to me, the confession was the cement which held all these tiny fragments of evidence together. I know that it was the thing that was influencing me. Subconsciously, maybe, but it was there. If you were told on a piece of paper, we did it, we were there, but ignore it. How can you? It's, it, it's, it's, it's impossible. Michael Howard has said he does not believe the case of the Bridgewater Four should be referred back to the Court of Appeal a second time. The Home Office says this case has been thoroughly re-examined. But over the years, doubts about the safety of the conviction have grown. First, there's Malloy's disputed confession. He insisted it had been fabricated by the police and forced out of him by violence, pressure and deception. From prison, Malloy gave his solicitor his version of events when the police began to question him on the 8th of December 1978 about Carl's murder. This is what he claimed happened. I don't know anything. I wasn't there. I've been asked the question so many times, I'm getting confused. And I wish you believed that I didn't do it. Won't anyone believe me? It has nothing to do with me. Malloy then claims he was shown a statement which the police said was signed by Vincent Hickey and which said that Malloy was at the farm. Hickey never did sign such a statement. You thick Irish mick. <laughs> Malloy said the police came back late on the night of Saturday the 9th of December after the pubs closed. You could have a case of ale if you sign a statement saying you was at U Tree Farm. <laughs> you was upstairs robbing the farm. <laughs> Malloy said he was reduced to drinking from the lavatory bowl because he was given heavily salted food and nothing to drink. He said he was woken half hourly through the night. According to a former West Midlands detective, in his experience, such coercion was not unusual. Giving them the most diabolical food and uh, drinks, etc. You tell them that he put disgusting things in the tea and things like that. You know. um, keep them awake, as I say. The threats or actual acts of violence carried out on them uh, repeatedly, it's enough to wear anybody down. Malloy says that out of fear and revenge on Vincent Hickey, he asked to see an officer called DC Perkins. There were two motors. There were two motors. A blue Cortina estate, which I went in with Vinnie Hickey, who was driving. A blue Cortina estate, which I went in with Vinnie Hickey, who was driving. <coughs> DC Perkins, who took the confession, had a history of violence and falsifying evidence. At the time of the Bridgewater inquiry, Malloy does not appear to have been his only victim. He was just animal. He liked to inflict pain, I think. He'd come in, he'd say, come on, admit to it, we know you've done it. And he'd start 
getting aggressive, pushing, punching, catching between the legs, I told you, your testicles twisting them, kicking in the back of the legs, slapping around the face, and a lot of things do it. Malloy said he was hit so hard the police broke his false teeth. The Home Office dispute that. They say a mugshot of Malloy taken ten days later doesn't show any sign of injury. No, they never left marks. That's one thing I'll say about the police. They did you and hurt you, but they'd never leave a mark. Perkins later joined the West Midlands Serious Crime Squad, disbanded in 1989 because of malpractice. He was disciplined twice for falsifying evidence. A Home Office document says this is only the tip of a somewhat polluted iceberg. But officially the Home Office says Perkins' offences are not relevant because they occurred seven years after Bridgewater. His colleagues say otherwise. John Perkins and her reputation for being violent as a boy, as a youth in the police cadets, as a uniformed police constable on the beat, as a detective constable on the local CID, with the regional crime squad and with the serious crime squad. He had this reputation of violence and falsifying evidence. It's quite clear then that Malloy's allegation that Perkins forced a false confession out of him is consistent with the officer's proven record. There's also one other powerful piece of corroboration for Malloy's claim. Quite simply, the disputed confession could not have been taken from Malloy in the way that the police said it was. The police version of Malloy's confession goes like this. They claim that two days after his arrest, Malloy, who until that moment had made no fewer than 72 denials of any involvement in the robbery, asked to see DC Perkins. I understand you want to see me, Pat. I must remind you, though, you're not obliged to say anything. Yes, sir. I know. I need some advice. I need help. I'm in a terrible mess. I was at the farm when the lad got shot. But I didn't know about the gun till after. I was told Jimmy did it, but it was an accident. Are you saying you were involved in the robbery but took no part in the murder? Yes, sir. That's right. I went upstairs searching for something of value. Don't worry. I am worried. I'm terrified of the others. They threatened me with personal injury. Well, uh, I had been drinking and cannot remember the, the exact time I was there, but whilst I was upstairs, uh, I heard someone downstairs say, be careful, someone's coming. Did you hide? Yes, sir. I, I hid for a while and then I heard a bang. I ran out. And what were the others doing? Well, they were all shocked and were shouting at each other. Who said what? Well, I heard Jimmy say it went off by accident. The police claim that Malloy then went on to make a voluntary confession statement. I, Patrick Malloy, wish to make a statement. I want someone to write down what I say. At the trial, D.C. Perkins said on oath that he wrote down the confession at Malloy's dictation. I need to tell you the truth. You wouldn't understand the pressure that I've been under. But in 1991, the defence got three experts to examine the confession. By comparing it with Malloy's letters, they concluded it was not in his own language. He'd been shot in the head. I was appalled and felt sick. The Home Office set up yet another inquiry. Merseyside Constabulary was asked to investigate whether Malloy's confession was genuine. 
it became clear the process leading up to it was seriously flawed. Yet the Home Office persists in finding nothing sinister in any of the police's conduct. The confession was made in a police cell at Wombourne Station. But the records of what happened to Malloy there are woefully incomplete. The police failed to record what went on in no fewer than 14 visits. The Home Office say they were probably welfare visits. This former officer says that's unlikely. They're more likely to go and abuse the prisoners or keep them awake. Put some other pressure on him to say uh, the other boys have coughed it. They've admitted it and they said it's all down to you, son. Uh, I don't accept welfare visits at all. No. Not by CID officers. Afraid not. Of the few interviews that were noted, no end times were recorded. But the Home Office put that down to the recording rules not being as strict as they are today. The expert brought in by Merseyside to examine the interview procedures doesn't accept that explanation. He's a forensic psychologist and teaches the police interview techniques. There is a sinister explanation why there are no end times. Which is? That Malloy was virtually continuously interviewed from the time he left the interview room and was placed in his cell. Why there are no end times is because it allows you license to fudge when one interview creamed into another. If there's a question mark over the police records, what about the confession itself? The police say Perkins went into the cell at 3.40 in the afternoon. 40 minutes later, he came out with a signed, written-out confession statement. The police account is that there was an interview until 4 o'clock in which Malloy confessed. Then Malloy dictated a voluntary confession over the remaining 20 minutes. But we don't believe this can possibly have been accomplished within that time. Some questions. There is only one officer who took the confession who is still alive today. In 1992, he was questioned by the Merseyside inquiry. Can you tell me how that statement was obtained? It was quite a verbatim statement. He was obviously distressed. And John Perkins obviously wrote out a caution. It was read over to Malloy. And he was invited to sign it that he understood what he was going to make. The statement was taken at Molloy's dictation in as much that he was very quiet and he sat quite often with his head in his hands. And at the end of the statement, the statement was read over by Perkins to Molloy and in fact, if I remember rightly, Molloy looked at the statement and he looked at it for a considerable time. This evidence makes the police claim that Molloy delivered his confession in 20 minutes even more incredible. The statement is 670 words long. Malloy would have to have reeled it off fluently at the rate of 33 words per minute. That's three times faster than Malloy's rate of delivery in a previous statement which he does not contest. And this does not even allow for the extra time that would have been required for Malloy to sign the confession statement eight times, make two corrections and to add a caption in his own hand. I have been told that I can correct. To test how long the confession statement is likely to have actually taken, Dr. Shepard had it repeated in an experiment in which the extra time consuming procedures were also simulated. This statement is true. I made it of my own free will. When you take into account how it must have been elicited, cautioning, the questions that they now admit they were asked in order to make it coherent and to make it flow, the fact that Malloy was distressed, they acknowledge he was distraught, that he took a long time, his head was in his hands, and he took a long time, a considerable time is the word used, to read the statement when it was given to him after it had been read to him. It couldn't possibly be done in less than 39 minutes. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give... If the confession took up nearly 40 minutes, there can't possibly have been time for an interview. On Sunday, 10th December, did you go on your own to the police station cell at Wombourne Police Station? Yes. 
But at the trial, D.C. Perkins had given a very detailed account of the interview, which he said preceded Malloy's confession. I said, are you saying that you were involved in the burglary but took no part in the murder? Malloy said, yes, sir, that's right. I was upstairs searching for something of value. I said, carry on, Pat. D.C. Perkins told the court this account of the interview was based on the notes of Detective Sergeant Robbins. Robbins was listening outside the cell. In 1992, Robbins was questioned about this by the Merseyside Inquiry. I understand that in most of the interviews you actually took the notes. I did, yes. Were they contemporaneous notes? As best as I possibly could, yes, sir. Okay. As close to the contemporaneous as, as ever I could. And I thought it was quite a good idea to take notes at the time. To try and be as fair as we could to, uh, to Patrick Malloy. That's all. Okay. Robin said that his notes, and his notes alone, had been the sole source of the officer's statements in court of their interview with Malloy. The notes had been handed to a typist. It was decided that she would type our statements from the contemporaneous John, notes John to make sure it was definitely what Malloy had said. Yeah. Okay. Robbins insisted to Merseyside that when he made his notes, he had not seen Malloy's voluntary confession statement. Did you make your contemporaneous notes after reading the voluntary statement made by Malloy to XTC Perkins? No, sir. The contemporaneous notes are contemporaneous notes. I did them there and then, and certainly not afterwards. I am. Um, your notes. I don't think my notes. I did Yet Robbins's statement of the interview that he said was based on his notes contain many of the same phrases in the same order as appear in the confession statement. Merseyside's own expert said it would not have been possible for Malloy to remember precisely the same words in the same order in two separate conversations. Robbins was called back for interview by Merseyside and he began to shift his ground. I want to know what you understand as contemporaneous notes. Well, these notes, I've never called them contemporaneous. To all intents and purposes, I believe they are contemporaneous because I'm writing as he's speaking. I'm doing them at the time. But they're not verbatim notes. In my heart of hearts, I'd say they were only about 70% of the actual. Can I say 70% of word perfect? And uh, did I say, did you hide? Yes. Did he? Yes. Robbins also changed the source of his account of the interview. Whereas, to begin with, he'd said the confession statement had not contributed to the account at all, he now told the Merseyside police that it probably had. I mean, that was gold dust. It's inevitable that the statement is going to feature in that, in case I've got something wrong down in the notes. And then I said, what were the others doing? The interview notes have never been found. The Home Office sees nothing improper in this, or the fact that the police now give a different account than Perkins gave at trial. Malloy's lawyers argue that this, the absence of proper records, and the fact that he did not have a solicitor, would have rendered the confession inadmissible by today's rules. The Home Office says it would have been admissible in 1979, but that is not the test these days. The common law has developed since then. We have developed since then. We have a greater understanding. The test now is, are we satisfied about the safety of this conviction, which involves the reliability of this confession? Answer, no. Michael Howard seems not to want to test the admissibility of Malloy's confession in the Court of Appeal. He also says Malloy repeated his confession right up to the day before he died in 1981. On the face of it, this seems compelling. But when these repeat confessions are more closely examined, they're nothing like as persuasive as the Home Office claims. The Home Office cite ten alleged repeat confessions by Malloy. Four are conversations overheard by police officers soon after his original confession and which they claim to have remembered 14 years on. On December the 18th, 1978, D.C. Wewell and D.S. Tooth 
were taking Malloy to Shrewsbury Prison. Well, you are in the shit now, Paddy, aren't you? Oh, no, sir, not me. I was upstairs when I heard the commotion. And when I come down, they were all shouting at each other. The other three confessions are all in the same vein. Later, Malloy explained in a letter why he'd repeated them. The verbals I repeated several times with some variations. I was afraid to do anything else at the time. I never expected them to be believed. So what about the reliability of the remaining six confessions? All are said to have been made in prison. Two prison officers claim Malloy told them Michael Hickey pulled the trigger. In his original confession, the police have Malloy saying Robinson pulled the trigger. In 1986, an anonymous rapist, X, claimed Malloy had confessed his part in the burglary. In 1992, another prison officer at Leicester remembers Malloy saying, If they still had the death penalty, I wouldn't be the one who would hang. The officer took this to mean that although he was present, he didn't actually pull the trigger. Of course, it could just as easily have been an expression of innocence. Pen. The fifth witness was a prison officer, Kenneth Mann. He says Malloy and his co-accused had all been remanded to Winston Green in Birmingham. In his police statement, Mann claims he personally knew Malloy from the 70s, always in and out of jail. Mann said he was shocked when he saw what Malloy was in for this time. How the hell did you get involved in this? I don't know. You prat. You're well out of your depth. It's that prat. He shot him. We didn't even know he had a gun. Yet again, Malloy is referring to Michael Hickey as the gunman. But there's another problem with Mann's evidence. Official records say Malloy was never admitted to Winston Green after the murder. He was at Shrewsbury and then Leicester. The four men were never in the same prison and for a good reason. Because Malloy had implicated the others, he was kept apart from them until the trial. Besides, it's very hard to see how Kenneth Mann would ever have had the opportunity to get to know Malloy in the 70s. Malloy hadn't been in any prison, let alone Winston Green, since the 60s. Hey, yeah, Green. And you saw him with your own eyes in Winston Green? Sorry, is that a yes or a no? Yes, yes, yes. And you knew him in Winston Green because he'd been incarcerated in Winston Green, is that right? I'll say no more. Well, hang on, it's important. I'm suggesting that that confession was concocted because he wasn't in Winston Green. Green. He wasn't in Winston Green. Finally, there is the anonymous witness Y, an education officer who taught Malloy maths and English in prison. One day she found herself alone with him. It was very apparent that he was reliving something. He told me he was at the farm during the robbery, but he hadn't known about them having a gun. He stated that he and Robinson were upstairs and the Hickeys were downstairs. Although very unusual, he seems so upset. I suggested we pray together. That evening, Malloy collapsed with a heart attack. The next day, he died. What he said to the teacher has been regarded as true because it seemed like a deathbed confession. But it contradicts Malloy's original confession. Here, he was saying Jimmy Robinson had been upstairs with him, whereas the police have Malloy upstairs alone and Robinson downstairs pulling the trigger. Nor is there any evidence that Malloy knew he was about to die. In fact, quite the reverse. He'd just written to his sister, saying that he'd been given permission to take the truth drug, which he hoped would prove his innocence. Repeat confessions are quite common. They are no indicator of the truth of the confession because once you have a momentum to confess, it's likely to continue. The courts themselves have recognized this in the sense that they would now say, if the source from which this confession emanated is tainted in any way, then subsequent material is also tainted and corrupted and contaminated and therefore susceptible to be ruled inadmissible. The fact is that over the years, the evidence that Malloy's original confession was a fabrication extracted under duress 
has grown stronger. Those protesting the innocence of the Bridgewater Four claim that the police should have paid more attention to another man whom they stopped investigating the moment they got Malloy's confession. Only a month after their conviction, an extraordinary event happened right next door to Utree Farm, where Carl Bridgewater was shot. Hubert Wilkes, who farmed Utree, was himself murdered by his friend, Hubert Spencer. Like Carl, Wilkes was blasted by a shotgun while sitting on a settee. After Wilkes's murder, the police revealed Spencer had been a suspect for Carl Bridgewater. Spencer was recently released from prison after serving a life sentence. Now, for the first time, he is questioned about the Carl Bridgewater murder. You had nothing yourself to do with the Carl Bridgewater case? Nothing whatsoever. Have you ever held back any information Regarding that relates to the murder of the Carl Bridgewater case that might shed some light on it? To the best of my knowledge, to the best of my belief and in truth, no. The coincidences which seemed to connect Spencer and Carl's killing were extraordinary. Antiques had been stolen from the farmhouse. Spencer loved antiques. He was a part-time dealer. A blue Viva, driven by a man in uniform, had been seen on the afternoon of the killing, turning into Utree Farm. The only local man the police could trace who both drove a Viva and wore a uniform was Hubert Spencer. He was an ambulance man. Later, the police discovered that ambulance records covering Spencer's movements that day were missing. Spencer also worked and shot on Utree Farm, a point he never mentioned to the police when they first interviewed him. That was why, eight weeks later, they came back to re-interview him. Have you ever visited Utree Farm? Yes, I have. Yeah, I've found out. Well, why didn't you tell the officers? Well, if he came out I was working on the side, I'd probably lose me job. What sort of work do you do on the side? Dealing in antiques? Yeah, I work on the farm for Mr Wilkes, and I do have a spare time job as a barman. Oh, you've been to the farm? Oh, yeah, yeah, hundreds of times. Do you own a gun? Did do until about 12 months ago. Where is it now? I sold it to Robert Thompson of 49 Kingsley Road. You knew Carl Bridgewater, of course. Yeah, well, you know, we used to live in the same area. Yeah, three doors away. Oh, didn't think it was that close. Well, you were 21, he was 25. Yeah, well, I've been away from there three years. He would, uh, he'd know you, I suppose. Perhaps. I didn't recognise him. Not telling the police that Carl had been a neighbour was important because they suspected that Carl had recognised his killer. There'd been no signs of stress like tears. Nor had Spencer told the police at first about his many visits to Utree Farm. When he did finally admit this to the police, he'd said he hadn't wanted to be caught working on the side. But to us, he gave a different reason. They had on their lap a copy of my application form for a shotgun certificate. And it clearly stated I could read it upside down. To shoot Utree Farm and Holloway House Farm land. No doubt about that in your mind? There is no doubt. Um, do you mind if I just show you copies of your shotgun certificate, yeah, which I've got here? And <clears throat> if you'd like to look through them, Perhaps you could tell me where it says U Tree Farm. Hmm? Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't, does it? No, it doesn't. Whereas Spencer had told the police he'd only one gun, to us he admitted there'd been more. But he saw no reason to tell the police this to help them eliminate him from their inquiries. Police officers and CID officers used to come in my shop and see that I was handling one or two guns a year. But we've What's already, the point we've of on, telling them agreed, what they knew? But we've already agreed that your shop wasn't in existence in 1978, so you say. Right. Whenever it was in existence, police officers came in and saw guns on sale. 
What's the point of ringing the police and saying, I sell guns? Why should you have assumed that these officers knew your pattern of dealing with guns? I also dealt with copper kettles and brass ashtrays. They didn't know about that. Mm -hmm. Why tell them? 107 or 108 One of the most extraordinary coincidences was Spencer's claim to have stumbled upon a piece of evidence directing suspicion away from him. Spencer says he just happened to be out walking when a card was spotted on the ground. It pointed suspicion towards another man. Spencer denies he wrote it. Handwriting experts are divided. But it was one bit of information that this time Spencer did volunteer to the police. I suppose the chances of you stumbling on a piece of paper that was written by someone else 15 miles from your home must have been, what, one in several million? Yes. But it happened. It happened. Just totting up the coincidences, there's the piece of paper found 15 miles away, yes. taking the heat off you. There's the fact that a Vauxhall, blue Vauxhall Viva car was seen around Yew Tree Farm on the afternoon of the killing. Yes. There's the fact that a witness saw the driver of a blue car in a uniform, and yes. you wear a uniform. Fascinating, isn't it? There's the fact that the lad was killed with a shotgun, sitting on a settee. There's the coincidence that the man you shot was killed pretty much the same yes. way. There's there the others. coincidence that uh, this lad was killed on land that you and Wilkes worked on and shot yes. on. So what? Quite a number of coincidences, isn't it? So what? There are more that you don't know about. Tell me. No. On the most important coincidence of all, the murder of Farmer Wilkes, Spencer has stayed silent. For nearly 17 years, he's never publicly explained why he shot the man he called his best friend. His silence has only fueled suspicion that Farmer Wilkes' death is somehow connected to the murder of Carl Bridgewater. About an hour before the shooting, Ian Jones had driven a tractor past Yew Tree Farm and had seen a Land Rover there. He thought it was just like Hubert Wilkes's Land Rover. 30 minutes earlier, the blue Viva, driven by a man in uniform, had been seen turning into Yew Tree Farm. Did Wilkes perhaps spot Spencer at the farm that afternoon? No, says Spencer, he categorically denies killing Wilkes because he knew something. He killed him, he now explains, because the 70-year-old farmer had designs on his wife. In his wild, senile mind, he claimed, in his earlier days, he organised wife-swapping parties with his farmer friends from Bromsgrove. He told me precisely how he did it. At the culmination of an evening's drinking, he would make what he called special cocktails. He claimed it was always foolproof. The ladies in the room were on cloud seven and the, white, the men would take their choice. He then said loud and clear to my ex-wife in particular, I have made you a special cocktail. And from that moment on, I don't really know what I did. I call it provocation. I did go over the top if it were provocation. I make no excuses. I haven't made any excuses for what I did. But why didn't you explain? It's a perfectly workable legal defence. Why did you not say to your lawyers, this is how this man wound me up? They must have asked you, why did you do what you did? Why didn't you tell them? They did. Why didn't you tell them? I believed, as I still believe, one of the people who were there at that night, who would have been accused by the media of wife swapping, mm -hmm. was suicidal then. So you are saying that you risked a life sentence because you wanted to protect other people, when in fact, had you told the truth, as your lawyers asked you to, you could have got a lesser sentence. It would have been possible. That's a pretty noble thing to do. So what? 
it is not credible that a man would go to prison for life when quite clearly he could have run a defence of provocation at his trial and probably uh, have received a sentence of perhaps five years, four years, three years. It is just not a credible explanation. For 17 years, the uncertainty over who killed Carl Bridgewater has caused suffering to his parents and damage to the reputation of British justice. For most of that time, the prosecution has kept quiet about an absolutely vital piece of evidence. Had the jury known of it, they might never have convicted the four men for murdering a child who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. We now know that whoever was at Utree Farm may have left fingerprints. Carl's bike had been picked up and hurled into a pigsty. A natural place to grab it was its down bar. Two fingerprints were found there. They were not Hubert Spencer's. And although the police had high hopes the prints would identify someone, they drew a blank. But when the case came to court, no mention was made of these fingerprints nor of the police's failure to identify them. More importantly, the court was not told the prints did not belong to any of the Bridgewater Four. So now the forensic evidence, far from helping the prosecution, was positively in favour of the defendants. And yet the prosecution kept quiet. They never told the defence, as the rules of fair play required them to, even though Carl's bike was brought into court and shown to the jury. I think that's deplorable. The prosecution knew there was vital forensic evidence and they kept it away from the defence. You feel cheated, you feel deceived by that. I thought the whole process was about, meant to be about the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Quite obviously it wasn't. The Crown also didn't own up to the unidentified prints on the bike before the 1981 and 1989 appeals. Non-disclosure, in fact, lies at the heart of the majority of miscarriage cases over the last decade. The non-disclosure of prints is vital because a jury asks obvious questions. It says, well, if it wasn't them, who was it? And that alone should refer the case back. We have learned that since December, there has been an exchange of letters about this non-disclosure between the Home Secretary and Michael Chance, the official who handled the prosecution for the then Director of Public Prosecutions. Mr Chance has told Mr Howard that the failure to disclose the prints has caused me a great deal of concern and that it was a disturbing error. Replying for Mr Howard, the Home Office Minister, Timothy Kirkhope, said... There was no reason to connect marks found on Carl's bike with the crime. Michael Chance disagrees. His reply to the minister is tantamount to a request that the case be referred back to the Court of Appeal. There has been inadequate disclosure of the fingerprint evidence, and this of itself militates towards the Home Secretary now giving further consideration. I think it is unprecedented, unprecedented, that a senior prosecutor, this is not just some lowly official, has made a comment that he is so concerned that these fingerprints were not disclosed that he believes that the case ought to go back to the Court of Appeal. Nevertheless, the Home Office has rejected Mr Chance's request. Instead, the Minister, Timothy Kirkhope, has claimed there's been nothing untoward about the non-disclosure because the defence was told before the last appeal that unidentified prints existed somewhere at the scene of the crime. Madam Speaker, the defendant's solicitors knew of unidentified fingerprints three weeks before the referred case in 1989. Well, he's being a bit economical with the truth. Of course, someone like myself would normally expect in a farm like that, where there are workers around, that there'd be all sorts of fingerprints. What Kirkhope did not disclose to me was that there were two fingerprints on the bicycle at the place in which a bicycle might expect to be handled and thrown, and that really is the important bit of information. In the two decades since this awful murder, Pat Malloy's confession has been discredited, the foreman of the jury believes the very men whom he helped convict are innocent, 
And now, even the prosecutor believes the case should be re-examined by the Court of Appeal. There seems to be only one obstacle to it getting there, the Home Secretary himself. Well, I find the Home Office's response totally unacceptable. They are usurping the function of the Court of Appeal. This is effectively Michael Howard stepping into the shoes of the Lord Chief Justice, and it's quite wrong. There is one footnote to this case which ought to weigh heavily with the Home Secretary. For over 17 years, three men have never ceased to protest their innocence. For the youngest of them, Michael Hickey, now aged 34, 17 years is half his lifetime. Last year, he was offered the chance of parole. He declined. He said the only way he was going to walk free was without the label, child killer. 